You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. The gospel is a word that when we're talking about religion quite often comes up you know quite often we might think of the word or we've heard of the word uh, gospel choir but tonight we really want to get an understanding of what the gospel actually is and get a clear idea of it and how the old testament teaches it often many religions or other christian denominations uh, you know they they talk about the gospel but there's no real i guess weight put on the old testament but as i said tonight we're going to see why it's entirely relevant and why it's entirely appropriate that we take and we read the Old Testament when it comes to the gospel. So let's jump straight into it. Tonight we're going to answer our question by exploring the Bible. You know, that's as followers of Christ, Bible believers, we base our life, our, our source of truth upon the Bible. The Bible is God's word, and there's countless, countless quotes within the Bible that clearly state this. But for the moment, we're just going to look at this one quote in 2 Timothy 3, verse 15 to 17. And it says, And from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So this here is just a small snippet of Paul's letter to Timothy. And he says, Timothy, all scripture, all scripture is inspired by God. And that word inspired literally means to be breathed out. So all scripture is breathed out. And he does that through men and women who were moved and were influenced by God's divine inspiration to record the words that we have written down for us in the Bible, uh, for us now. So despite many men and women uh, contributing to the words found within the Bible, ultimately it was God in complete control of the words recorded in what we now call the Bible. And the amazing beauty of this is that Despite being written by men and women across thousands of years, across different lands and geographies, its internal consistency is amazing. It's staggering. You know, you can only imagine if you or I were to commence writing a story even a hundred years ago, say, and we wrote the first chapter and then 10 years later we put it down or we put it down and then 10 years later, someone came along and picked that up and they continued writing it. And then 10 years later, the same happened and so on and so on. You can imagine what kind of story, um, storyline we'd have, you know, what the original author had intended the story to be would very unlikely, um, be what actually occurred. And without reading the previous chapters, the future authors wouldn't be able to maintain the same storyline or the principles, um, without having to flick back into the previous pages to get an idea of you know, who these characters in this story you had were, you know, how they acted, what did they say, uh, what did they value? And so you'd get this complete mix-up or this broken storyline, and that's what makes the Bible so amazing, and quite honestly, a miracle. It's, it's clear, it's logical, it flows. You know, themes and principles you pick up in one part of the Bible are maintained and built upon in other parts of the Bible. And often many parts of the Bible were written without the knowledge or the foresight of sections that were written down uh, many hundreds of years later or before. So to have that 100% consistency is, is amazing. And it's this internal consistency which gives it the unique ability of the Bible being able to interpret itself. You know, threads are woven all the way through the Bible. Passages of scripture, uh, themes, doctrines, principles and prophecies, they're all woven into God's word and it all works. It all fits in line with previous applications of 
the usage of these words. And it builds upon itself and it reveals itself if we're prepared to search, if we're genuinely prepared to search and and to search the matters out and take on its message. And I hope that tonight you'll, along with me, be able to see this principle and see why the Old Testament is not only relevant, but it teaches the the, the gospel. So tonight we really aim to break down this theme for tonight by asking ourselves a few questions and hopefully by the end get a really clear picture um, and a clear answer to our question for tonight. Firstly, we're going to look at what is the gospel? We're going to look at why, why is it that we're looking at it? Why is it important? We're going to look at, well, where is it seen in the Old Testament, which I guess really delves at the heart of our topic for tonight. We're going to see what does Jesus Christ say about the gospel, and then we're going to look at the end, why it's relevant for you and I. What is our response, and what is it that we need to do as a result of this gospel message? So our first question is, well, what is the gospel? You know, it's all good and well asking ourselves, how does the Old Testament teach the gospel? But first, I suppose it's actually important to understand what the gospel actually is. So if you were to Google it, as every astute and reliable researcher would do, and as I have up on the screen, you would get the following definition. Under definition one, you would get, uh, or you'd read the teaching or the revelation of Christ. And apologies if that's a little bit small. We'd see under that same definition one, a thing that is absolutely true. So that's where we get the catchphrase, you know, if something's gospel truth. Someone might ask you a question and you'll say, it's for sure, it's, it's gospel truth. Uh, still under that same first definition, we'd see a set of principles or beliefs. Or another word they've got up there is doctrines. So it's clear rules and guidelines that can be described as gospel. Uh, Under the second definition, the record of Christ's life and teaching in the first four books of the New Testament. So quite often, uh, the first four books of the New Testament are called the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then under that third definition, we have, uh, which we referred to earlier, the African-American evangelical religious singing, um, which, yeah, comes up quite frequently in the context of gospel choirs. So not a bad definition overall um, from Google. We can get a few key words from that. We can see that it's clearly an important part of religion. It has to do with Jesus Christ, his life, his ministry, his teachings, and that whatever this gospel is, these set of principles or beliefs, it's, it's true. It's absolutely true. And you could say that it's gospel truth. If we were to look up what the gospel means in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, we would get the following definition. We would read uh, under 1a, the message concerning Christ, the kingdom of God and salvation. Then uh, under section b, we would read one of the first four New Testaments, uh, New Testament books telling of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we've already seen that um, in our previous definition. And then under C, an interpretation of the Christian message. So again, principles and guidelines taken uh, from the Bible. Which, again, this is not actually a bad description. It has to do, we saw, we can see there in 1A, with the message concerning Christ. And we've just seen that in our last definition, and the kingdom of God. So the question is then, does this line up with the Bible? Does this line up with what the Bible says and Jesus explains the gospel to be. Well, here we have three quotes uh, on the screen from Matthew, Mark and Luke, all these three gospels. And they all provide parallel records of Jesus' life and ministry. And it's all from different perspectives. If we were uh, to witness a story and we all recounted that story, no doubt um, we would all sort of pull away different points and different little details. And that's the same for Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all pull away from witnessing a same event, different little details, and they write it down. 
So here in Matthew chapter 19, we read, And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. So Matthew says, if we leave for my name's sake, he says in Matthew 19, we'll inherit everlasting life. Mark says, And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you that there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake and uh, for my sake and the gospels. And then in Luke he says, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake. So after reading all these three quotes of the same occasion and the words spoken by Christ, but obviously recorded in three different gospels, we can see that the gospel, the kingdom of God, and Jesus Christ, they all come under the same banner. They're sort of interchangeable. They all come to mean the same thing. The gospel is the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ as described between these three gospels. So again, not a bad definition by the Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary to describe it in that way. So with those definitions now in mind and what they mean in a modern context, we turn and look at what it means in the Bible. And if we want to do that, um, we can use a really helpful resource that was created by Dr. James Strong. And Dr. James Strong, he created the Strong's Concordance, which no doubt uh, many of you have heard. And he clearly has a very, come up with a very original name. And the way that he created this was by using a numbering system. He collates all the different occasions that a word is used and he separates them by their meaning. Um, and, he, and he allocates it a, a particular number and provides a more defined meaning and it gives more of the sense of what the word truly means based on its context and the way that it was written. You know, obviously we have words in the English language that, you know, it's the same word, but they all have multiple, multiple meanings and can be interpreted slightly differently. And that goes for the same in the Hebrew and the Greek. So if we were to look up the word gospel in the Strong's Concordance, we would have the number G2097 or G2098. And it has the literal meaning here of good, a good message um, or good news, but a good message. Now, if we were to look at other occasions of where this Greek word is used, we would find quotes such as Acts 8 verse 12. Um, where we read, but when they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. So here we have the word preaching and it's the exact same word as gospel. He says, and what they're preaching or, or gospelizing about is the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So it's all beginning to line up, isn't it? You know, the gospel or, or preaching, the message concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, it's good news. And that word, uh, that Greek word literally can be whittled down to a simple meaning of something that is good. So the question that we have now is, well, what is this good news that is within the Bible, within this gospel message of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God? Well, one of the first things that we learn about and that the Bible explains is that it's more than just good news, isn't it? It's essential for our salvation. Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, pretty clear, isn't it? The outcome for us because we sin when we go against God's laws or, or principles, is death. But the free gift given by God is eternal life. And how do we receive this gift? Well, in our next quote from John chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that 
whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life for god sent not his son in the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved so if we believe we won't perish but have everlasting life and what are we to believe well mark 16 has that for us in verse 15 to 16 he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be condemned so whoever believes this gospel message this gospel preached shall be saved Paul says in Romans 1 verse 16 he says for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek so Paul who is writing to the the Romans here in this case is writing to them about how important this gospel message is he says I'm not ashamed of that gospel and why well because it has the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it it's pretty clear isn't it and that and that's how important it is if we want to have a hope you and I of something else beyond death something else other than death then we need to understand the gospel but do you know what there is there is a danger there is a warning because paul says that there can be these false gospels turn to galatians 1 verse 18 uh, verse 8 to 9 just a few pages earlier paul says but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed as we said before so say i now again if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received let him be a curse so sounds like pretty strong language doesn't it paul's saying even if we including himself teach another form of gospel let us be or let them be accursed and we know why he's speaking so strongly don't we if we don't if we don't believe it if we don't have a correct understanding of what the gospel is then we will miss out and we will not be recipients of that free gift that free gift of eternal life so if someone paul's saying is out there preaching something and he includes himself that isn't what i'm writing to you now and what we'll go on to read that he says in the later chapters he says if it's not what i'm saying to you now let them be accursed they're pushing away many or others from that free gift of god eternal life it's literally a matter of life and death right well now we get to really the heart of our topic tonight which is where is the gospel in the old testament and how does it teach the gospel well first before we turn to the old testament let's go back to our reading uh tonight in galatians chapter 3 because in our reading tonight paul gives us the map to point us where this gospel was first preached back in the old testament if we have a look at galatians 3 verse 8 8 he says and the scripture foreseeing that the that god would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto abraham saying in thee shall all nations be blessed so we learn a few things from this verse don't we this gospel paul says in galatians 3 verse 8 was first preached unto abraham so whoever this abraham is and, and what he did it involved believing in god and this gospel message and the fact that he believed in what god had said meant that he was given a promise and we can see this in the end of verse 8 he says in thee shall all nations be blessed but this promise paul says that this promise is as being equivalent to the gospel 
The gospel was preached to Abraham and it's summarised in the saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So who was Abraham? And what is the context and why is this saying relevant to the gospel? Well, we read about Abraham, don't we, right back in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. So obviously already the origins of the gospel are right back being introduced in the Bible right at the start of Genesis, at the beginning of the Bible. So clearly it's important if it's uh, being introduced so early. And if you're thinking that, well, the gospel came into existence during the time of Jesus or the apostles or the gospels or the disciples. No, Paul tells us that it's been around since Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And you know, the whole context of Galatians chapter 3, the law, the works of the law, not being able to save. It was an argument to the Jews um, in the Galatia region who thought that the law could save people. And Paul has to make the point, it's not the law that saves, it's the gospel. The gospel that saves people was before the law of Moses, before the law was introduced, before what you're saying is the thing that saves. So turn to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 to 3. Now, the Lord had said unto Abraham, or Abram, sorry, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So God appeared to Abram and told him to go to a place that God would show him. And Abram went not knowing the location and that place was the land of Canaan or um, modern day Israel. And you can see that up on the map. He leaves Ur, which is modern day Iraq region, heads up to Haran and then he makes his way down to Canaan and has a little bit of a period of time in Egypt, but ultimately ends up in, in Canaan. But we read there at the end of verse 3, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. You know, that sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Look at Galatians 3 verse 8. All nations, all nations, he says, uh, Paul says in Galatians 3 verse 8. And Genesis 12 verse 3 says, all families of the earth will be best, b- blessed. So slightly different turn of phrase, but it's the same, it's saying the same thing, isn't it? So that little section here in Genesis 12 is described by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3 as being that gospel preached to Abraham. So look at just how the Bible is explaining itself. Promises made to Abraham thousands of years earlier are picked up by Paul in his letter to the Galatians. And he says that those promises in Genesis 12, that is the gospel. Well, what was Abraham actually promised? Well, firstly, he was promised a national promise. He says, God says to Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation. Secondly, there's the personal promise. He says, I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. There will be a family promise. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And then we have the international, the global promise. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. In that last phrase, Paul picks that up and he says, that's the gospel. That's the gospel message there. So the promises sound pretty good, don't they, for Abraham? But clearly that hasn't happened yet, has it? You know, it wasn't only the prom... uh, Genesis 12 wasn't the only promise that Abraham was given. God gave a number of promises throughout his life. Genesis 12, um, obviously what we've just read there. Genesis 14 in verse 14 to 17. And then in Genesis 15 to se- and Genesis 17. Hebrews says that Abraham was known for his great faith in what he had been promised. He said, uh, the writer of the Hebrews says, by faith Abraham when he was called out to go out into a place 
which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. But despite all of these promises and being recorded as faithful for these promises, he died without inheriting any of them. He was promised a land, wasn't he? Yet it says later on in Genesis that he had to buy a small portion of land to bury his wife. He was promised a massive seed, yet he never truly saw this before he died. So this all raises a few questions, doesn't it? What's the mechanism that this all comes to fruition and how does it relate to us and how will it be achieved? Well, Abraham does, uh, in verse 4, does what God asks. He says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of, out of Haran. So God says, uh, Trust me, do what, uh, do what I say, and you'll, you'll be a recipient of these promises. And Abraham does. And when he gets there, God says in Genesis 12, verse 7, he says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So God says, you've, because you've left, because you've hearkened unto my word, you've listened to what I've said, unto thy seed, you and thy seed, will I give this land? And just make a note of that word seed because um, we'll refer to it um, quite shortly. And turn back with me to Galatians chapter 3. So just seen in Genesis 12, God tells Abram to leave Ur and to head to Canaan. And because of it, he's promised these promises to him and his seed. And then we read in Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. Galatians 3 verse 16. Now to Abram and his seed were the promises, promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So Paul says now to Abram, says now to Abram and his seed were the promises made. You know, that's true, isn't it? We just read and saw that in Genesis 12 verse 7. Unto thy seed will I give this land. So Paul picks it up here in Galatians 3 verse 16. And what's the point Paul's making? Well, he's saying when God said in Genesis 12, Unto thy seed will I give this land. In Genesis 12. He's not talking about a multitude of descendants in the plural. He's talking about one. One seed. And that one de descendant, Paul says, is Christ. So when Abraham was promised that land would be given to his seed, that was a promise made to Jesus Christ. That's the biblical exposition and Paul's explanation under divine inspiration of Genesis 12. But we might say, well, you know, it's not very relevant for me. It's relevant for Abraham, sure. It's relevant for Jesus Christ. Yep, I can see that. Well, Galatians 3 verse 26, we read, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. We've read that word baptism just there in verse 26. Uh, sorry, verse 27, I've just skipped over. For as many of you as have been baptised, so baptised, we've read that. Mark 16 verse 16, He that believes and is baptised shall be saved have been baptised into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the act of baptism is identifying with Jesus Christ. You're no longer, or I'm no longer Elliot Wigsell, 
Instead, Elliot Wigzel baptised becomes Jesus Christ. I put him on and I identify as Jesus Christ. You look at Elliot Wigzel and hopefully you see Jesus Christ. But in the, in the process, you have through baptism. And when that happens, verse 28, Paul says you all become one in Christ Jesus. You are that one seed. Your identity goes... And any individual identity that you might have is gone because we've become one in Christ. We've put on Christ. And, all, uh, and that's all through, through baptism. And he says, and if ye be Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. Because verse 16 says that Abraham's seed is Christ. So it's pretty logical, isn't it? If we're baptised, we've put on Christ, we've lost our sort of individual identity... We've become Christ, and therefore, if we're Christ, we've become that one seed, Abraham's seed, and then we're heirs according to the promise. So how does it affect us, and, and why is that promise to Abraham and a promise to Abraham's seed, Jesus Christ, of any use to us? Well, it's of use because we identify with Jesus Christ. We become Abraham's seed and we become heirs to the promise. And that, as Paul says, under divine inspiration, the gospel. We've referred to it a few times, Mark 16, verse 15 to 16. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptised shall be saved. So baptism is that key step, the essential for, uh, step that we need to take. And in doing so, we identify with Christ. And it's pretty clear and it's pretty direct and straight to the point. It says, if we do believe, well, then we shall be saved. There's no ifs and buts. It's we shall be saved. And if we don't, we shall be uh, damned or, or condemned. Well, how is this all going to happen What is all the nations of the earth being blessed look like? Well, this is God's ultimate purpose with the earth, isn't it? God has a purpose with the earth. And that purpose is the key theme of the Bible. Understanding the key purpose of the earth is, is seeing what the gospel is pointing towards. Numbers 14 verse 21, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Isaiah 45, for thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it and established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So both very clear, God has always intended to have a purpose with the earth and it's to set up a kingdom which will be filled with his, with his glory. Well, what does this kingdom look like? Well, this is what we can look forward to. And this is what the kingdom will bring back to this earth. Firstly, immortal life. We've already sort of uh, mentioned that in passing with eternal life in quite a few of our quotes. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about immortal life. Environmental restoration. There's obviously a lot of environmental damage going on. But Psalm 72 talks about the environment being restored. Peace and security, Isaiah 2 uh, talks about. No more pain or suffering. Uh, no more physical or mental health conditions. Jesus Christ will rule righteously in Luke chapter 1 and everlasting joy in Isaiah 30, 35. And if you think this is all a jump or a stretch too far, this idea of a kingdom being established, being saved to eternal life. I just want to quickly look at a few quotes from Christ to show how truly important this is. Because this gospel we're discussing tonight is what Jesus believed and he prayed for. John 17 verse 3, just quickly uh, turn there with me if you will. John chapter 17 verse 3. This chapter is a prayer of Jesus. 
And he says in verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Matthew chapter 6 uh, includes the Lord's Prayer and the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So pretty incredible words in the context of what we've seen tonight. Jesus prayed for the time when this mechanism for how it will all be achieved. Abraham receiving those promises, us having an opportunity to be involved in these promises and receiving this amazing gift and the time when God's ultimate purpose with the earth would be fulfilled. And he says it pretty clearly, doesn't he? He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. He prayed for it. He told his followers to pray for it. And to pray for this kingdom to be established. You know, the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ really captures the whole essence, doesn't it, of God's purpose and the whole essence of the gospel, which is the revealing of God's purpose and how he is going to achieve it. What have we seen so far? Well, we've seen that the promises were made to Abraham and his seed in Genesis uh, chapter 12. Paul then picks that up and he says that seed isn't uh, plural, it's singular. It's talking about the seed, which is Jesus Christ. If we then believe this and we're baptised, we identify and we put on Jesus Christ. If we then have identified with Christ, then we become the seed of Abraham and then we become the recipients of the promise And the promises will ultimately be fulfilled in that kingdom of God. So it's pretty logical, isn't it? It it makes logical sense the way Paul breaks down uh, Genesis chapter 12 and he explains it to the Galatians. Well, hopefully uh, we've seen tonight that the Old Testament is completely relevant for the gospel message. But I guess the next natural question you might be asking is, well, What is next? We've already seen we need to believe the gospel. You know, things concerning the name of Jesus Christ, that one seed in the kingdom of God which will be established on earth. We've seen that to become heirs according to those promises, we need to be baptised, we need to identify with him. You know, it's no longer Elliot Wigsell, it's Elliot Wigsell baptised as Jesus Christ and, and we identify with him. But is there anything I need to do after I'm baptised? And if you're asking yourself that question, it means you're on the right track. Because it's exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. If you'll just quickly turn there with me. Romans 6, verse 3 to 4. He says, know ye not, so this is all in the context of baptism. He says, know ye not that so many of us were baptised into Jesus Christ, were baptised into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So Paul says once you're baptised, you need to walk in newness of life. When others look at you, they they need to see those qualities of Christ in you. Because it's no longer Elliot Wigsell, it's it's Jesus Christ. Galatians 2 verse 20, if you'll turn there uh, back to the chapter prior to our reading. Galatians 2 verse 20. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I live, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself 
for me. It's a bit of a tongue twister quote, but essentially Paul's saying, and the simple message is, that we don't live unto ourselves. We live as Christ. We've identified with Christ and therefore as a result, we live as he did. And we do that because he gave his life for us so that we could be saved. For the sake of time, we won't turn there, but Mark 8, verse 35 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9, they talk about living the gospel, living the name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Hebrews 12, verse 28 says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. So the writer of the Hebrews says, we've been given a kingdom which, can be, which can't be shaken. It's, it's a sure reality. It's going to happen. So therefore, as a result of this, live a life of thankfulness. And how do we do that? Well, Christ in the context of talking about the kingdom says in Matthew 25, he says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger and ye took me in. Naked and ye clothed me. I was sick and ye visited me. I was in prison and ye came unto me. And he says at um, end of verse 40, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it, you have done it unto me. So Christ is saying we live our life of thankfulness by the way that we treat one another. And in doing so, we will inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, well, let's wrap up by taking a look at an overview of what we have seen tonight. Firstly, we saw, didn't we, that the gospel is the good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. We saw that the gospel is the power of salvation, and if we believe it, we shall be saved. And it's why Paul said that he wasn't ashamed to preach this gospel message. Paul said that the gospel was first preached to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. And those promises were to Abraham and his seed, which was Christ. We've seen that if we identify with Christ through baptism, then we become Abraham's seed and recipients of those promises. We've seen that God will establish a kingdom on earth and it will be filled with people who reflect those Christ-like qualities and that will ultimately fulfill his whole purpose with the earth. And it was just seen there at the end, there needs to be a response. You know, belief and baptism are the first two steps, but then as a result, we need to walk in newness of life, living the gospel in thankfulness and the way that we treat one another because in that you've done it unto the least of my brethren you've done it unto me so hopefully as we leave this place tonight we uh, know a little bit more about this amazing gospel message this good news of eternal life we've many lectures on this topic and on other topics that we've touched on here tonight but the key is isn't it that that we need to believe, we need to be baptised and we need to respond and we do that in our day-to-day -day actions as we await the sure return of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom. Thanks.
Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.